So about 28 years ago, I'm sitting in a really just dingy, dark jail cell, and I belonged there at the time. I mean, I, what, I, what they were accusing me of doing, I did, and uh, yeah, and I, and I was supposed to be there. And I was surrounded by other people who were supposed to be there, you know, and uh, the culture uh, in that place and in that environment was very selfish, very self-centered, and very me first, man, and you know what, whatever I got to do, you know, I, and if it, you know, if it requires moving you out of the way, then no problem, I'm going to do it. It wasn't, there was no other centered uh, community thought at all, and, uh, and which made the place even darker and even more grim. I mean, the only light that I had at the time was this book that I was reading. I was reading this book, and, uh, and you know, for the first time, I started to understand what this book was telling me. And I was reading about a group of people that was exact opposite of the people I was surrounded with. I mean, these people that I was reading about were like these others-centered people. They, they, were, they were a you-first community of people. They were a people of, of self-sacrifice. And they were willingly, willingly loving one another and willingly putting each other first and, and helping one another be good and better and stronger. And it was kind of amazing you see, and I, and, and I was reading about how there was this constant encouragement. Don't let any division take place here. Don't let any selfishness kind of take over. Don't let anything get in the way of this unity. You know, and then I'd look around, man, and I'd just see the way people would look at me. Like if they had to take me out, man, and kill me just to get my possessions, that they would have no problem doing it as long as it made them better. It was the exact opposite. You see, this, this culture that, that I was reading about, this group of people I was reading about, was called the church, right? Uh, you probably already know that. But what was mind-blowing to me is I was reading this history of the church, you know, 2,000 years ago, and then I would consider the landscape of today and, and church life today, and I thought, you know, I don't know that this looks like this anymore. You know, and when I consider all the divisions that are taking place in the church alone, and I'm not even talking about being in jail or any people or a group across the world, but in the church, this one, this, this, this history of unification and love and others first. As I thought about it in today's culture, I thought, you know, this, this doesn't look anything like this. You know what I mean? At least I haven't seen it. You know, when I hear about all these, this church and this church and this church and how they just don't like to be around each other, it was kind of weird. But what was even cooler is that the contradiction that I saw in the current reality uh, didn't cause me to take the book and just throw it away because, you know, that would probably be, you know, kind of a natural reaction. Yeah, this must have been nice back in the day, but today this is, this, this is not even possible. But what I did think, I thought, what if? You know, this is 28 years ago. I'm sitting in a jail cell, man, and I belong there. But I was thinking to myself, what if? What if it was still possible to have this type of community? What if it was still possible to be this kind of people, you know, that had this type of, 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 of center that was not them and really wasn't even theirs. It was a center that was greater than them. Wouldn't it be amazing if this could still happen? And I was challenged right there in that jail to try to create that community. And I started praying, and I started allowing God to lead me, and I started inviting others to come and just kind of let's just talk about him, and let's just learn about him. And it was amazing how just in that, just with that little bit of, you know, countercultural, you know, movement taking place in a place where, you know what, that just doesn't happen, I started to see these, the craziness that was on the faces of these men start to fade. The selfishness that was in their heart started to, to fade away and dissipate. You can actually see, see, hear it by the, the way that they would talk to one another. And where instead of like me first and not you and only me, I started to hear encouragement that reflected the word of God that we were reading together. It was mind-blowing. 
Right? And I started to see, you know, because as I was reading, I was seeing all this encouragement of this oneness and this unity in the church. There's one, one, uh, one, one, one leader in the church, all right, back in the day, his name was Paul. He actually wrote to a church and he's encouraging this type of oneness. And these guys weren't even in prison. They were out in the free world, man, and able to do whatever they want. And he said, look at, he said this in, in a book that, he, that is called Ephesians. It was because this letter was written to a church, all right, and he tells these guys in, in Ephesus, he says, I therefore, he says, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. He actually wrote this book from prison to some free people. And he says, I'm going to urge you guys to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He says, don't just talk about this, man. Don't just, you know, think about how great this would be. I want you to actually walk this way in a manner that is worthy of to the calling to which you've been called. God has called you to himself and to one another. Can you walk worthy of that calling? He says, do this with all humility. Stop trying to, be, trying to be bigger and stronger and better than everyone around you. And with all gentleness, you know, he's take, take, you know the power that you have. Set it down or use it to lift others up. He says, do this with all patience. Relax. Don't try to make everything happen right now because you're, you're, not, you're not the one in charge right here. And he says, bear one another with one another in love. It's, it's easy, all right, to get over our own problem. Once we get over our own problems to say, okay, I'm in the clear. And, and to just not to disregard and to ignore the problems of other people. He says, look at me, no, I want you to recognize that once you overcome, help others to overcome. And allow that room for growth. And this is huge right here. He says, be eager to maintain. This is, e you gotta, come here. You have to check this out. Be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What, it blew me away when I read that. He says, look at, it's not up to you to create unity. If I have given my life to Christ and you have given your life to Christ and we are appealing to God Almighty as our Father, then he has already unified us. He's telling us to be eager and ready to, to recognize that unity and to pursue it and to maintain it, to cultivate it. He says, in the bond of peace. He says, there's only one body. One church, right? There's only one spirit, his Holy Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. There's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. One faith in the, in the cross and the resurrection of Christ. One baptism and I'm all his. And one God and Father of all who is in all and through all. All right? And in all. And over all. He's saying, man, y'all are a part of each other. Imagine. Imagine if you and I if we pursued to maintain that unity, to walk in that manner that is worthy of the calling in which we've been called, to put on, to clothe ourselves with humility and gentleness and patience, to bear with one another, man, imagine, in love. It's not hard to imagine. But imagining is just getting the easy part done. What does it look like? I want to challenge you to a few things. Number one, man, recognize, allow people to stand next to you. Allow them to get a little close to you. Allow them to stand. Stop trying to be out in front all the time, away out in the shadows all the time. Allow them to stand next to you. And every once in a while, man, and even more than once in a while, allow them to go out front a little bit. Encourage them to stand out front and back them up and, and encourage them on and love them forward. And then in everything you do and in everything you consider when it comes to this body that God has created, choose to love first. Choose to love first. Because if we would just choose to love first, well then he's glorified, man. 
I mean, we've, we've, we've created all this, this room and this space all over the world for these gatherings and stuff like that, man. But that cannot be, this cannot be the, the, the height or the epitome of your walk with Christ. No, that's together. Side by side, encouraging others out front and loving first. One. When God looks at his church, how many people do you think he wants to see? How many do you think? You say, oh, the whole human race. Yes, but he likes to look down there and he wants to see one whole person, one whole body. Millions of people as one. It can happen. We can do it. By his glory, for his glory, by his power. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus loves you and so do I. See you guys.